Uh, but as far as the, the question, as far as programming goes, I think that there needs to be collaboration across the board. There has to be interagency collaboration. Uh, we can no longer operate in silos as we all are islands unto ourselves. DFAX can do its thing over here, DOE is doing its thing over there, DJJ is doing something different, but we all need to come to the table more frequently, share our resources, share our ideas, see what's working, see what's not working. Um, groups like this today, um, you know, this, this is where the work starts, this is where the synergy starts, this is where the collaboration starts. So, that, you know, when we leave here today, I've already, you know, gained great responsibility and great respect from some of the information that's been shared. So I know now that there, there are other programs, there are other things out there that can be uh, brought back, you know, to uh, DHS that we can implement and maybe somebody can take what I've shared and take it back with them as well. But I think the key is collaboration. Thank you. Thanks for that nice plug. Your check is in the mail. <laughs> um, so I've got a, a myriad of questions. Some of them we've sort of started to touch on already. Um, this one I'm going to ask. Don't. This is from Sharina again, um, and it's for you, Jessica. I think. Um, how do you get community involvement in low-income communities or shelters? How can an organization partner with these programs? Um, and then, Jenny, is your program only for educators, or can community organizations get involved? So, who, who wants to? You want to start, Jenny? And we'll see you next time. The question is: Can community involved? Yes, please, <clears throat> and please contact me. We actually have um, several. When we have trained schools, we have had several um, organizations who are involved with kids after school or individually attend the training. We're really in process now. The Boys and Girls Club I've been contacted by because this framework applies in the home, anywhere in the community. So we are hoping, and that is our goal, for uh, this language and vocabulary to be in all settings for kids. So it, it's for all. Involvement in low-income communities or shelters. That's a great question. I guess who asked the question? Can you tell me more? I guess what you. Okay, I work with the shelter. We have a lot of business owners, short house, short house, and then about the off balance. The kids are really solid that stuff because they're going from one shelter to the next. How do you involve those parents when they work with the kids? Well, I mean, I think that the quick answer is it's a challenge sometimes. Um, uh, sometimes not as much as you would think. Um, we certainly see students like that, and I just now saw Denise Reynolds, who's back there from Atlanta Public Schools, who is over all the school social workers for APS. Um, and Denise, feel free to chime in. Um, but we certainly do see um, families who are living in shelters and who are highly transient. And, um, oftentimes it's because of, you know, they're in bad women's shelters, for example. So they're not, you know, disengaged parents necessarily. They're, they're dealing with a circumstance that hopefully is, is short term. And so they do want to be involved. Um, other times we can work with staff at the shelters if the parent is for whatever reason that maybe their situation is different and the parent is not very engaged. Oftentimes shelter staff are very interested in doing what's right for the children. Um, in our case, the quick answer is we do it case by case. I mean, it just really depends on the situation that's in front of us. But there's certainly important partners. Denise? So Atlanta Public Schools provides tutors for the shelters for our students that are APS students. So if you are in a shelter in the city of Atlanta, you can get in contact with our homeless education liaison and we can put a, shelter, a tutor in that shelter. If, if we have contact with the parents, which generally we are going to be in contact with the parents, we found something that never fails with the parent, even those who are different, the ones who are most different. We ask two questions. Number one, what are your goals for your child? No parent has ever told us that that was a, that was a bad question or took offense at it. And every parent has a goal. What do you do better? 
maybe that's as sophisticated as it sounds. And the second question is, well, how can we work together to realize that goal? And if we're able to get that going, and that's not a, that's not something that you ask once and you walk away. That it takes it takes a continued level of engagement. That those two questions for us always work, and that they they don't feel like they're being told they're a bad person, or that they're turned off with uh, with you think I'm a project and you need to work on me. Actually, it's a decent question for us to have ask us of ourselves is what we're doing, what are our goals, and how can we help to fulfill those goals. Oh, and one other thing I want to mention: we have a uh, on our website, we have a parent support center, which is great. I mean, a lot of people aren't on the internet that we're talking about, but more are than we are than we think they are. And so there's lots of things for parents and how they can work with their teachers when they feel overwhelmed. Um, are you you're good? Because I was going to um, this one is from Shakita Ogletree. Hi. Um, how often are students um, involved in your program development and implementation? I'm ask anything about How often are students involved in the program development and implementation? Um, we um, annually go to the clients and ask for that kind of input. It's a structured kind of questionnaire. Um, Thing we do, we mail it out, it's available online, and we also have a year end party for all of our students. And we take a paper copy, old school with pens, and ask them to please you know, take a couple of minutes and fill it out, and then um, provide incentives for, for the clients that do fill it out, parents and children. Um, we have different incentives, you know, grocery store gift cards or, or uh, fast food restaurant gift cards um, that we'll. we'll send out if they'll complete so to try to increase that level there. We also always have a former client on our board of directors. So the same thing with parents, we, we always ask the kids what are their goals. We're not trying to tell them what their goals are, we're trying to find out what they are and then we can build on those. And we just yesterday did a thing called Reality University, which takes kids and what they want to be and want to be this where are you now? Where are we now? How are you going to get to where you want to be? Reality University begins to, it, it, it attaches a financial salary to what they want to be. It also shows them where they are on their current track as a student and how that's going to get them to the work where they want to be. And, and that, out of that, becomes goals and then programs begin to develop, or ways that we deal with children begin to develop from that. But they have to be, as their parents, they have to be drivers of this. And we try real hard to make sure that. They're telling us what they want and not us making up ideas for what we want that to be. Yeah, that's a great question. Shakita, I think, is uh, well aware of some of the stuff that we know. She's been helping us, uh, helping us with some of the things, so we appreciate that. But it is, it is when you're sort of uh, an advocacy group and you're dealing with a bunch of lawyers and you think about hot glue policy issues to forget about that you really care about the kids, and sometimes you need to ask them you know, what they think about things. So, um, Early on, when we did our detailed study of the student disciplinary system, we, in cooperation with the PTA, put together a, a survey, an online survey that we sent to parents and students uh, uh, to uh, get their input on the student discipline issue. We have another project ongoing uh, about through the King and Spalding Law Firm, who's our lead partner, to do an assessment of the educational attainment issues and sustainability issues in connection with children in care that's ongoing right now. We did focus groups uh, on some issues using uh, kids who are in kids in care. Um, the, uh, as, as part of our Just Georgia partnership effort, we partnered with uh, the Georgia Empowerment to uh, obtain the views of kids who have been in connection in touch with the juvenile justice system in many ways. And, they testified at hearings uh, and working with us. Uh, and most recently in our Columbus office, we have a new Columbus office, um, and we have a, a, a local change initiative going on there with a community action group that's really taking a close look at the student code of conduct. And one of the things we did in cooperation with Muskogee County School District was to convene students from middle school and high school from throughout Muskogee County for a one-day uh, focus group in which we were asking them what their perceptions were of the challenges of the uh, of the uh, student discipline system in Muskogee County so that input can influence how we try to 
advocate for necessary changes to the code of conduct. Um, I want to answer this uh, kind of in, in, in a candid way. I feel like it's not enough. Uh, when we say we, we do, we involve the children in, in the discussions about their futures and, and defects. We do involve them. IOP, EPAC, we involve them. We ask pertinent questions of how can we assist you? What is your goal? What is your long term short term? We, we question it to death, but then there is an extent to where it's still not enough. Um, the biggest concern and the biggest comment we get for most kids to exit care is that um, you didn't really ask how I felt or what I wanted or I didn't have a key decision in this process. There's a there's a still a lot of angst with, uh, and that's one of the things that we're really trying to focus on right now is that to correct that divide between children and care having some type of say because uh, on first glance they already feel like I've been stripped away from my family, my home, my school, my friends, and everything that I've been doing for the last 18 years of my life is what somebody else told me I had to do. Even when we ask them what they want to become when they, you know, matriculate, it's, it's still, we're asking, but it's still with an, an already expected end in mind. And we don't really allow them to really drive the discussion. So I would say my, my short answer is not enough. Uh, I know we do some, but still, it's not enough. You took the words right out of my mouth. I'll just briefly add on um, what what is currently in place is the Georgia Student uh, Safety Health Survey or Health Safety Survey, and I don't know if the general public knows that much about it. In previous years, it was voluntarily used by schools. It was administered to specific grade levels. Now that we have and soon to roll out a school climate rating as part of our uh, accountability system in Georgia, that will be taken into account in determining a school climate rating. The teacher evaluation system now has our new evaluation, teacher keys evaluation system has a component of student survey. Um, that being said, there is not enough. Uh, first of all, uh, federal grants. Federal grants. Is um, separate federal grants, I think there are some federal grants that schools are using to implement and change practices and get professional learning, if that's what you were going at. As far as legislatively, positive behavior interventions and supports is contained in IDEA, the Individuals with Disability Education Act, that it is the only place that it is mandated, and for any student with a disability whose behavior is impacting their performance must have positive behavioral interventions and supports provided. If we just focus, and that's kind of where we used to be, was the focus on how to do that for individual students. We're still working on that, but having to go to that bottom tier. The problem with grants, and that's the only scary thing, is grant funding ends. And if we haven't built capacity internally, it does not have for long. It's about system change. The second part of the question, that was the second part. I mean, oh, it's, it's, it's building the, the, I think it's building the culture and the climate of the school. I think that's the number one. If I could walk away with one other thing, one thing of this, I would, I would say what you're talking about, Jenny. It's the culture and the climate of the school. How do you create that? How do you make kids feel welcome? How do you make them feel smart? How do you make them feel uh, that they're encouraged and they're not problems? They're not negative. I think that. That the culture of the climate of the school, which is the responsibility of the principal, which Gail works on training principals about that all the time, how do we create that in a school and how do we therefore pull in everybody that we need to make that happen? It's not just going to happen with the teachers, but if you have the right culture and the climate in school, which means it's a community effort to create that culture and climate, I think greater numbers of our children will be set up, especially the ones who are in, in, in danger right now. I think what I heard as part of the question was uh, that relationships are very important in the school setting and to the extent that we're seeing higher class sizes that we're putting more, making it more difficult for teachers to have that a level of a personal relationship and to respond to need. And I think that's, that's certainly a reality. I think in part, the comments earlier about the structural framework. So, you know, it's not just, you know, the, it sounds trite in some sense, but the bus driver and the school 
lunch worker have the same sort of responsibility to know the kid and to maybe see a, a danger signs and that sort of thing. So you sort of, that's part of the PBIS process. You broaden the, the connection base. The other thing is, I, and this is more maybe just theoretical, but oh, the PBIS and, and something called response to intervention, which has been around a long time, are all premised on this sort of uh, pyramid theory. If I'm uh, not mangling it too bad, but the theory is that like 80% of the kids are not really going to be a problem. I mean, they're going to be like me when I was growing up. I mean, I if I thought I was going to get in trouble in school, I was going to, you know, this was never going to happen to me. I would do anything but get in trouble in school. And for some reason, I wanted to succeed. I don't know how I got that. I wanted to do well in school. So, and I think, you know, a substantial number, I don't know what the number is right now, but a substantial number of kids are like that. So, some sort of general, what they call tier one involvement, expectation setting, and that sort of thing is going to, in a large part, work for those kids. And by using data and other information, you, you can then identify the smaller group of kids in tier two who need more intensive interventions, maybe some group kind of setting help, and then you, you really focus on the 10 to 15 percent of the kids in general who really need intense interventions, the tier one kids. And so at some level, even with the, you know, fun, uh, you know, the, the difficulties in class size and everything, you've got a process if it's followed with fidelity that allows you to sort of get the best bang for your buck in terms of figuring out the kids that you really need to deal with. And one thing, that I, I, I just, um, We'll say because I'm not sure. It, it will allow us, I think, to begin to think about things in a different way. Uh, it struck me. It struck me recently in some of the meetings I've been in, and, I, and this may not even pertinent to this question, but that's, since I got a microphone, um, is that we, we're becoming more and more aware when the tragic, um, you know, impact on the lives of troops coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan about uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress, stress disorder, and. I've been seeing a lot of talk nowadays about we you have to realize that a lot of our kids in our school system are the reason that they're acting the way they're doing is very analogous to you know, PTSD. They've been exposed to some sort of trauma, whether it be a family breakup, seeing you know some family member shoot himself or be shot or go to prison, whatever it is. And it's it's heartening to me that we begin to talk about that. And, these are the kids who are in that tier two or probably in the tier one. And, and to think about how we deal with, with that um, in that way, it sort of makes sense to me. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it, I think, pushes the ball forward in terms of how we manage, manage kids um, and, and their behavior and our expectations of them a bit more. I'm going to, um, once again, take moderator's prerogative I know we're short on time, and, and Rob, you know this like sweet spot for me. The the whole um, trauma responsive uh, piece of schools. Um, it has to do with this teacher thing, it has to do with social workers thing, it has to do with having social workers, it has to do with all kinds of things. And I just um, and I know we have a few more questions, but I'm going to wrap them up in my final question. Um, but I would love for each of you to just t take a minute and talk about trauma and its effect on learning and, and what we have to do in schools and outside of schools to deal with this pervasive problem. Um, well, it is a pervasive problem. And um, one of the things that's exciting in Fulton County, and I know it is not the nexus of the University of Georgia, but the court is looking into becoming a trauma-informed court so that there will be a coordinated effort to train probation officers and everyone who interfaces with that child and family on the impact of trauma. Um, I mean, we know the impacts of trauma. Is, you know, our children are depressed. They have a hyper alert response. Um, they have trouble with social inter interaction and impulsivity. I mean, the, 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 the effects of trauma are many and um, they run very deep. So. Um, and, as, and as you say, Rob, it's, um, it is absolutely uh, pervasive. It's very, very prevalent in the children that we see and the families that we're interacting with. Again, you're going to have to get somebody in touch. Somebody needs to be talking to these people. Somebody once said, this, this kid, this boy over here, he needs a good listening to. <laughs> if we're going to try to get to them, we've got to allow them and give them permission to talk about what, what's going on and make that opportunity, a real and genuine and safe one for them. I mean, that's part of where this, this begins. And then from there, 
other people can be brought into the process. I actually wanted to add one more thing because that, that, that's right. It's, it's training the adults that are going to interface with the, with the children and their families on the impact of trauma. And that was one of the things that we talked about in, within our circle is that one of the most important things that we are not looking at is the impact it has on the professionals. When you work day after day with children who are impacted by trauma, the burnout rate is enormous. And the, the adults that are interacting, the probation officers, the teachers, the school counselors, um, you know, you walk away from these interactions and you just feel like, God, why am I so tired? You know, it's that kind of thing. And so that if we don't start taking care of the professionals appropriately, through education and support systems, we're not going to do right by the kids and families in the end. Uh, to add to that, trauma, trauma has been one of the uh, key buzzwords around uh, DHS for the past uh, two years, so much so that uh, every child in its care, uh, as a result of our new policy released this year, has to have a trauma assessment. Uh, in addition to that, our systems of care unit is, is now um, using um, the results from these trauma assessments to make best interest determinations around placements, school settings, things of that nature. Uh, and and to, to really add, you know, even more light to that, um, one of the things that, you know, what we're finding out is that uh, every child that enters care has been exposed to some type of extreme trauma. But, but not only have they been exposed prior to entering care to trauma, that even during the duration in care, there is consistent trauma with uh, the placement changes, with the neglect and abuse in, in a lot of uh, congregate care settings and things of that nature. So what we're also learning and looking at is that not only are we trying to assess the, the pre-care trauma, but the during care trauma as well as, as a major influence and, and how we curb and stop some of the things that are that are going and take going on to take place in care. And a lot of the work that we do is around functions of behavior, and that analysis is not just for students identified with disabilities, but part of the work that school level teams do and begin to look at the data very frequently and very quickly um, through identification and early identification, early warning systems that school will set up and whether it's teacher nomination, parent nomination, um, someone connected with the child outside is um, looking at functions and looking at interventions directed toward that but also functions because a lot of times we don't know that it's trauma and schools see the behavior and the behavior is consequent uh, according to codes of conduct large function of school teams is, okay, we have kids, but what is going on, and really looking at functions of behavior, which is really the currency, and that work then, there are too many kids that are in schools that the school personnel are not even aware of the trauma um, and how that trauma is impacting and what it's, it looks like bad behavior in schools, but so a lot of that is the team looking at, as a matter of fact, when they um, do referrals and schools will revise their office referral forms, the staff is sort of looking at what potential motivation is, if it's attention or if it's escape, and then the teams actually look at that um, and, and go deeper on individual student loss, kind of through the tiers that Rob, you did such a great job, by the way, um, in explaining all of that. Because I know we've run over, I hope everybody Okay, you guys still good to hang for another question or two? Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, if I turn, I don't know what happened to the air. I'm sorry. At first it was like a meat locker in here, now it's like an oven, so I don't know what to do. I don't know what happened. Um, but we'll, we'll try not to think about it. Just pretend you're in San Diego where it's like totally perfect all the time. Um, so, there, there are a couple of questions that are more curriculum related that I'm going to sort of hold off on and let um, whoever asked them to come and ask you guys offline later. But one of the questions that sort of is in the same category is please talk about the roles of social workers, counselors, et cetera, um, in, in PBIS, and I would say in public education. I think one of the things I learned from going to a lot of committee hearings is budget hearings especially. Um, is that there's money for, there's money recommended for social work, there's money recommended for speech and language therapists, and it is given to the school systems oftentimes by the state and then not used for that because it's recommended, it's not mandated. 
Um, do you think that that as we all learn more about uh, the wraparound stuff for kids in schools, that that will be used to talk a little bit about that whole whole thing? Of this sorry, continue. Um, yes. And I think you won't talk to many school personnel that won't say we need more help. And help in the area of behavioral expertise, expertise and knowledge of the things we've been hearing about today. Those are the vital roles that social workers and school counselors play at the school level. And unfortunately, the sad reality, which relates to an earlier question, is the economic times we're suffering in Georgia and the impact it's having on our schools. And I think what it takes is cries from the community. It's grassroots level that we need help. We, this is a priority that there are a lot of jobs that need to be done in a school. And having people with the expertise on what's available for kids, we, we can't do without. So, um, and unfortunately, many school personnel will tell you that's exactly the first thing to go are those extra additional supplemental uh, supports. I know what else is going to say. And the rest of the questions really are. are Let me just add two things about that. Um, one is uh, one of the things that we're thinking about trying to encourage as part of local change initiatives is to see the way in which we can engage um, local resources, the mental health resources that are not. Not affiliated with the department, not the school, but to, to work with the school system. It has a very fine, um, something called the Pastoral Institute in Muskogee County that has wonderful mental health services that are run through uh, the contributions of the faith based community there, and they do a great job. Uh, we'd like to figure out a way, and I think they're certainly willing to help out. The um, uh, question is how do we connect those, and how do we make that happen? How do we get those volunteer mental health services available? The other thing, this is just me talking, uh, because there are going to be um, certain locations in Georgia, given the size of the state and the difference in the demographics of my favorite. We have school districts, you know, all the way from Gwinnett County at 160, 170,000, down to Tolliver County with 250 kids in it. So we have this broad range, of, and obviously we have a lot of rural school districts where simply the services may not be available. And so I have in the back of my mind, and, and at some point in time, technology. How can we take advantage of technology to create sort of vir virtual mental health services? So it's not ideal, perhaps, but if you've got the kid down in you know, southwest Georgia somewhere where there's not really the services there, uh, wouldn't it be better than nothing to have a qualified mental health specialist on Skype with the kid talking to him, trying to figure out what's going on? And trying to make an assessment at that level. So I think we need to think about how we can leverage technology in this area. Again, you know, taking advantage of you know, you know, the fact that here in Metro Atlanta there are obviously a lot of resources that aren't available in other parts of the state and how we can connect those up. Well, Georgia Telehealth does is working on that very thing. Uh, how to virtual virtually connect. They're having a conference coming up here, I think, too, on that particular topic. Yeah. And we've got some communities, some uh, school-based health center folks here. So um, it's good. And I'm going to, if you guys are school, I'm going to ask um, one more policy kind of question. And I'm sorry, go with the lawmakers. I think I skirted out of here before I could get to this question. But we can all tell them what the answers are. Um, every year, it seems, at the State House, we come up with legislation wanting to punish parents for kids being truant. I mean, it, it never fails. There's always somebody who's got a bill that wants to take parents and find them, put them in jail, um, put them in the courts somehow for kids who are cutting class. And we finally got the Juvenile Code passed where we aren't going to put kids away for cutting class anymore, which is great, awesome. Um, but I, but there's, I, I guarantee there's going to be one this year, there's going to be one next year, there's going to be one the year after. And I'd just like to hear your responses to legislation around truancy. Um, well, that one, it, it, it does come up. It comes up at the state house and in local, um, mm -hmm. on city councils um, all over the state. We hear about it constantly. Um, and 
you know, uh, what to say about it is uh, I think you can't overestimate the need for simplicity in people's lives. And I think people, you know, legislators are, uh, you know, looking for a quick fix. That's the, I think, um, the root of hopefully what they're after, not just, you know, sound bite. Um, but, you know, you're right, it doesn't work. Um, you can't, you know, especially the parents we're talking about, you usually got a single parent who's working and not, you know, aware that the kid is skipping. Um, most of the families we see are lower socioeconomic, and a lot of those, a lot of that legislation um, talks about fining parents, and our parents don't have the money to pay a fine if you know, they got sanctioned. Um, a lot of them are unenforceable, they're unfunded, um, so they're, they're just sort of one of those frustrating things that I think all of the advocates deal with, and a lot of it is, you know, then we rally and go down and we do our education piece um, and talk about support instead and the things that we all know that, that these families are, are really in need of, which is not more finger wagging. Uh, I think that that's a message that sells back home, one of those kind of messages. I think it's uh, retribution is one thing, accountability is another thing. Punishing parents, maybe not get them to be accountable, so that we need to work on accountability, and then that leads us to support, which you just mentioned. So unless we're going to pay that price, there is no shortcut to that. And, and so the policy level to punish without accountability, or the opportunity to develop accountability, and then, of course, building the support so that accountability is achievable, that's no easy avenue, but I think that's what's going to produce the kind of results. I, I agree with that. I mean, I think there's adequate statutory authority already there for the extreme case. I mean, I think there is still such a thing as educational neglect, so that if it you know, reaches that level, then you, know, you can get defects involved and deal with the child's well-being, which is where we ought to focus. Uh, I guess if I were going to espouse a law that I thought would make a difference, I would espouse one that would change the uh, mandatory education age from 16 to 18. Um, and uh, I think that would have a much more positive effect. It has enormous ramifications, I understand that, but I, that, that's where I focus my energy. Again, just to add what it was already been stated, uh, I mean, it, it sim simplifies, it doesn't work. Uh, punishing parents uh, for, for uh, children who are children, it, it just it doesn't get to the root of the cause of the problem. It doesn't address the issue. It doesn't really ask the pertinent question to figure out uh, the questions we should be asking. Why are you trying? Why don't you want to go to school? Is school difficult for you? What do you need to stay in school? What, can we, uh, what type of supports can we put in place to solve the problem of why? The big question, why don't they want to go to school? What's wrong at school? Um, so that if we, can, if we can help them answer those questions and then we can get them to attend school, we can, we can if, you know, eliminate the whole, you know, because right now we're just creating another problem. If I'm a parent, single parent, whatever the case, whatever the scenario, you're going to find me and I'm already having, you know, financial issues. How do I pay my fine and maintain, I'm already making a check to check week to week. You're going to find me and, 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 you know, we're creating more problems. We're creating more social problems to solve the social problem. It doesn't work. Take the words right out of my mouth. It doesn't work. Um, it might satisfy some people initially that we've done something and we're, we're doing something about this problem because we don't know what else to do. And we in Georgia are pretty punitive. We still have corporal punishment in places. We are such big suspenders. We don't really have um, a lot of choices, it seems, in places. So the idea really is, and Rob mentioned that earlier, if within a school you have more than a small handful of students who are chronically absent or chronically truant, then it's a school problem, not a kid problem. So that's, again, teams looking at their data. If you have more than 5 to 10% of your kids who are failing, who are the truant, who are the problem, if you have more than that, a school has to look at what are we doing here that might be contributing or at least not addressing the problem. So then there are, I think it's complex, it's complicated, not all kids are truant for the same reasons, not all parents are responsible in the same way. So we can't look at it all the same way, but it has to really be looked at if within a school, it's more 
than a, a small percentage of kids. Then we've got to look at what, are, what is the messaging? Why don't kids want to be there? And that's my first question. This should be the safe haven, the place kids want to come. So my first thought is we have a lot of truancy, a lot of skipping of classes, and we're looking in the classrooms, and we're looking at the buildings. So, and you know, prevention is the way to address this. We certainly have to deal with issues as they arise, but it's about prevention. It's having it, school being a place where kids experience success, feel like people believe in them, somebody cares if they show up or not whether it's the custodian or the cafeteria clerk, and there are too many kids that don't have that. So it is about establishing a climate in a school that's a safe place. It's the place people believe in me. Um, and, you know, the parents are a piece of it, and I think it's an important piece, but I'll frequently go into schools and say, I want all my educator friends from the State Department to cover your ears because I'm going to tell you school people, forget the parents. There are issues with parents you are not going to fix. I have news for you. Your responsibility is the six to eight hours a day you have these kids. So you tell me as an educator what you're doing. If you're in a community with high problems and there are so many social problems, your school should look very, very different. And I hate to throw out names of some of the schools, but we've put them out today. If you go into an inner city urban school that has a set of issues and, and social problems that are not in existence in Johns Creek, your school should look different. You should have interventions, programs, relationship building that they don't need in Johns Creek because those kids don't have that problem. So um, it is about each individual school within their district looking at their data, identifying, and setting up preventative proactive strategies. We're never going to cure it all. But if we don't go back to that issue of the aquarium water is sick, and no matter how much we tend and punish parents and throw them in jail, if we put that, expect that kid to go back into the school that is just not conducive for his needs, we'll be right back where we started. And one more today. Um, I, I taught for 10 years in Atlanta Public Schools, middle school, behavior disorders, special ed. And I was always given the roughest, toughest, whatever, first day of school, they were coming to me. And the, the biggest concern that was given to me is keep them in school, keep them in the class, keep them in the class. And my predecessors before me always failed. They always failed. The kids, by week three, month one, they weren't in school. Well, I went back to my grandmother, who was a 30-year educator, and I asked her, how did she do it? And she said, son, the thing is basic. Everybody wants to feel wanted and needed. Everybody wants to belong to something. And when you talk about kids who have experienced trauma, neglect, abuse, heartache, pain, whatever the case may be, they all want to belong to something. They want to feel connected to something. So the moment I started making them feel like, you belong here. This is Mr. Barry's class. You belong here. No matter where you go, you have a safe place here. Nobody else is going to bother you. If you don't want to go to another class, we'll figure out another way. I'll go with you. Once they felt like they connected with me and that I was there and I was their ally, I had other kids coming to my class, cutting classes coming to my class because they wanted to be in a place where somebody fought for them, advocated for them, stood up for them. Uh, that's the basis for all of this. If, if the kids want have a sense of, 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 of somebody protecting and, and fighting and, and, and championing their cause, they will go. And not only will they go, they will, they will succeed, they will you know, work hard, they will do everything that they need to do once I feel like somebody wants me. And I think that's the biggest issue that we're skipping over, we're glazing over. We have a population of teachers who don't want to teach certain kids. We have principals who don't want certain kids in their schools. We have community, people have said, I, they don't verbally say it, but they act it, I don't want you. And when I'm not wanted, fine, you don't want me, I don't want to be here. We have to show the kids that we want them. Every child, every chance, every day. That was my model. Every child, every chance, every day. When we want them and show them that they belong, they will show up and perform. The group that does the most about school climate and change is GUSI, the Georgia Leadership Institute for School Improvement. So if you really want to figure out how that works or how, or how you can get school systems to respond to this, that's what Gail Hume and her fantastic staff do all the time. So I think that we need to figure out a way to get them involved in, with anybody who wants to do something about school climate. That's the organization set up to do that. Not that they don't need other people, of course they do, but they're really great at thinking through this problem. I don't know.
Oh, well, we don't want you to miss your Involved in your neighbor association. Um, if you have kids, get involved in their school. Um, volunteer with a program like TIP. Um, I, there are lots of ways to get involved. I think it's just stay curious and stay involved and stay very fast. These kids need a lot of voices. That's a tough question to answer because I'm not sure who everybody is here. Uh, so let me just say that we we want we're a collaborative organization that's a partner with with a wide range of folks. We have um, two or three projects that I think we're beginning to work with. We, as you've heard, very interested in being part of a collaborative effort to support the Georgia DOE's initiative to create a situation in which those schools that, 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 that elect to do so can implement the uh, PBIS uh, uh, frameworks. Uh, even more, substantially more extensive than they are in Georgia, because I firmly believe that that is maybe, uh, if not the silver bullet, certainly a, a, a great move toward making a shift, a culture shift, and a, and a paradigm shift that we have to do here in Georgia to deal with the public education system. Ancillary to that, we're about to embark on a project, uh, we hope, to, uh, to encourage the state to take another look at what's called the Model Student Code of Conduct. Uh, it's a, a, State Park, State uh, Board of Education rule that sort of sets a, a model which the district already used. My judgment is that the model is, is flawed at this point, it's out of date, and for there to be an effective PBIS program, the model needs to change so the school districts can change their codes of conduct. We'd invite uh, partners to help us as we move forward and try to convince uh, the administration of Georgia DOE and the State Board of Education to do that. And finally, we're engaged in local change initiatives throughout the state of Georgia, we, um, uh, in Albany and in Columbus, and hopefully in Atlanta, and I'll be going to Savannah tomorrow. And we're, we're aware of the political nature of Georgia as being uh, a state where uh, local initiative and local change is paradigm where there's not a great appetite for state-mandated topside down activity. That's why we don't talk about mandating PBIS in every public school in Georgia, simply because we know there will be a negative reaction to that. We want to encourage it and allow it to happen and provide the resources. But we do believe that it's important to go out to local communities, parent groups, faith communities, spread the word about the information that we found, and collaborate with those folks to give ideas about how they could encourage their school districts to make changes, be it, be it PBIS, or be it the implementation of some restorative justice programs, or teen courts, or other things that can move forward and help out. So to the extent that you have influence in your local community, and, and would like to hear about how things are going from a student uh, discipline standpoint in the local communities, and perhaps engage with us in making some changes, we'd love to do that. Um, sign up with the uh, voices for Georgia's children. <laughs> uh, no, you said check is in the mail. <laughs> uh, seriously, no. Um, we we all can pitch in and just do our part, and, and it really just boils down to an appetite, a desire to see change. Um, Dr. King said it best: everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't need a PhD to serve. The subject and verb don't have to agree to serve. You just need a heart full of grace and a soul full of love to serve. Once you see the passion and find it, um, you know. Go forward with your full intent and, and just serve, serve where the need is. On the end of the handouts I gave you is our website. We have written a white paper at the DOE, and it's not real long. It would be the best source 
place for you to educate yourselves on what it is, why we need it at Georgia, and what the status currently is Georgia. Secondly, uh, we actually had two state representatives at the summit who continue to be involved. Uh, Dr. McGivney has already presented a number of times across the street. Both uh, education committees in the House and Senate um, have had presentations, are very interested. We have legislators on board. As you hear this coming up support, we are in the process of drafting a state plan that will have five-year goals and objectives, and our goal is to get uh, PBIS implemented in every district in the state. Um, secondly, we will be drafting a letter of, uh, I don't know what we'll call it, a statement, a letter of support, I'm not exactly sure what we'll call it, seeking the signatures of the agencies and organizations that you're part of, in addition to all that were represented at the summit, to say we want changes in Georgia, we want to focus on school climate. Georgia's leading in that work right now around school climate as far as evaluation. So what you can do at the grassroots level actually have more uh, power than we do at state level because we're a local control state. We can't go in and tell them what they need to do, but tell parents all the time in groups like yourself, if the practices aren't right in, that, in your area, that's when you start advocating for more. Well, I would like to say uh, a few closing comments of my own. First of all, thank you all for coming and, and giving, whoa, now they cut off my power. <laughs> first, the heat, first the air and then the water. This is a sure sign the lights are going out next. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I want to thank all of you guys for taking time out on, on an afternoon. I know you all have so many things to do. And I'd like to thank our panelists, who are totally awesome and took time out of their busy day. And I would like to encourage you to get your calendars out and write down our next Georgia Children's Advocacy Network meeting. I have, uh, I'm still working on the topic, but it'll be fascinating, I guarantee it. Um, September 24th, in this very room, from 2 to 4, and you'll all be emails about it. Um, and then the one after that will be October 29th, um, from 2 to 4, in this room as well. Um, you can wear a Halloween costume if you really feel so fine. Um, but I'd like to, to also encourage you to forward our emails and things to other people that you think would be interested in children's issues. Uh, we are trying to grow, I mean everybody always says this, but every, organ, every group I work with, we're trying to, to get a movement going. I think it's really important, you know, kids need every last one of us and everyone we know, right? And not only do they need, a, do they need us, but we need them because they're, I mean, they're the future, but they're really going to be the ones not only leading, but taking care of us. I mean, let's face it. So I think that, you know, the paradigm is starting to change. I think a lot of us have done a lot of this, this work. Everybody on this panel certainly has worked very long and hard at this, and many of you in the audience, if not all of you, um, have worked hard at this. So spread the word. I mean, to get people to sense so they can be, so they can get the information they need to serve, to do the work they want to do. So that's, that's what I would say, and thank you once again. And, um, as they say across the street, we are adjourned. <laughs>